started. Welcome to the uh, Circus Lunch Seminar. I'm very happy to introduce Anupam Data, who uh, is an assistant research professor at CMU, although uh, he's currently been enjoying the sunny weather of the West Coast for, uh, for most of the last year. Uh, Anupam's research started off looking at cryptographic protocols and reasoning about their correctness by using programming language techniques and ideas. Um, more recently, though, he's been moving into looking at privacy and thinking about how we can formalize uh, privacy um, and use those formal models to reason about various aspects, audit, accountability, blaming people. And that's going to be the topic of uh, Anupam's talk today. So thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, thank you all for uh, coming. Um, I want to talk today about some work we've been doing over the past five years or so on privacy, trying to understand what privacy properties are and how we may want to enforce them. And just to provide some context, we live now in a world where personal information is everywhere. Google knows what time I wake up and what time I go to sleep. Facebook knows who my friends are, what they like and dislike. Amazon knows what books I buy and what TV shows my wife watches. My bank actually wishes me happy birthday. <laughs> and Macy's sends me anniversary greetings. Now it's nice that we live in a world where many of these services have moved online and our lives have become simpler because of that. But it also raises a big privacy problem. And the specific class of problems that I'm interested in is given the way personal information has now moved out to all these organizations, how can we actually ensure that organizations respect our privacy expectations in the collection, disclosure, and use of these huge hordes of personal information that they have. And one technique that, or approach that, has come into place now is that we are beginning to see more and more privacy laws, or at least promises, that are made by organizations. In certain sectors, like healthcare in the US, we have laws like the HIPAA privacy rule that lays out specific operational conditions under which personal information will be shared or used by healthcare organizations. So here are two examples of clauses from HIPAA that says, the first one says that a covered entity is permitted to use and disclose protected health information without an individual's authorization for certain purposes like treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. The second one says that a covered entity, that's a hospital or a healthcare organization, must obtain an authorization for any disclosure or use of psychotherapy notes. And HIPAA has over 80 such clauses. And in, in addition to the HIPAA rule for uh, the healthcare sector, there is gram leach Bliley for financial institutions, FERPA for educational institutions. In the EU, in, the, in Europe, there is the EU privacy directive and so forth. So this is one mechanism by which people are hoping, we are hoping that these kinds of organizations will respect our privacy expectations. In self-regulated sectors like the web, we don't have operational laws like these, but we do have promises that are made by various companies and they show up in their privacy policies. If you look at Yahoo's privacy policy, it says something like, Yahoo's practice is not to use the content of email messages for marketing purposes. Uh, Google has something similar in there. So it's good to have laws in place and it's good to have these kinds of privacy policies or promises that companies are making. But, um, and so here are some examples from Facebook and if you look inside the Facebook setting, you'll see similar promises. But the question is, are these promises actually being kept? Are these laws actually being complied with by these kinds of organizations? And you'll see a lot of news articles now that unfortunately the picture is not as rosy as one might expect. So there are a lot of breaches of uh, HIPAA-related breaches in the healthcare sector. Uh, Facebook ran into some rough water because of not following the promises that they made, and Google had this issue with Google Bus a little while ago. These are just a few examples, and this uh, series of articles in the Wall Street Journal provides a good overview of the kind of privacy issues that we see 
uh, as these big organizations that hoard personal information follow some pra uh, questionable practices. So given that this is a very real and pressing problem, the question that uh, we raise here is, how can we computer scientists help address this problem? So to make things a little concrete, I'm going to look at a very concrete scenario and a concrete example of a privacy policy from one of these laws, and then that'll raise some technical questions, and I'll get into more details as we go along. So let's look at a simple setting of uh, healthcare privacy. Well, maybe not so simple. Uh, imagine a patient who comes and shares their personal health information with a hospital. And this hospital might share that information with other entities, like an insurance company, in order to get payment and so forth. But violations happen when that information might be shared outside of the expected privacy uh, policy, maybe with a drug company, which then does advertising. And it's not just flows across these institutional boundaries that could be problematic. Inside the hospital also there is a complex process involving accessing this personal information. And if information is used or accessed internally, irrespective of, uh, while not regarding the these kinds of temporal constraints show up a lot. So one common, other common example of a temporal constraint is a consent. So if a patient consents to uh, disclosure of their information, then that disclosure is permitted in many cases. Another kind of future temporal constraint is about notification. So in many data breach notification laws, it's required that if a violation happens at a certain point, then within a certain number of days, maybe 30 days or so, the organization has to in inform the, and the customer, the individual, that their information has been lost. Now, in addition to these, there are other concepts like purposes. So you see in this example, this kind of disclosure is allowed only for the purpose of identifying criminal activity. There are also things like beliefs. So the, in this particular example, the belief that the crime caused serious harm is essential for the disclosure to be valid. So these are the kinds of concepts that show up in not just HIPAA, but a bunch of other privacy laws and policies that we have examined. And I'm going to, for the purposes of this talk, separate it out, these concepts into two parts. I'm going to call these things here black and white concepts. As we go along, we'll see that we hope we can try to enforce these parts of the policies completely automatically using algorithmic techniques. And then these other things I'm going to uh, called gray concepts, and they're going to be trickier to formalize and enforce, and I'll show some results that we have on, in particular, on trying to enforce these kinds of purpose restrictions. So at a very high level, the goal of this work is to formalize privacy policies, give precise semantics to the kinds of privacy concepts we see in these laws and promises that companies make in a way that we can use the formalization as the basis for enforcement. And by enforcement, we are going to primarily look at audit techniques that are useful for detecting violations of policy after the fact, because prevention is going to be very difficult and even impossible in certain cases. And accountability, meaning that once a violation has been detected, we would like to identify which agents to blame for a policy violation. And once agents have been blamed appropriately, we also want to punish them to deter future policy violations. So my talk today is going to focus primarily on the audit part for which we have uh, concrete technical results uh, recently published. And these two topics are actually, uh, two of my students are working on their PhD thesis on these two forms of accountability. And to think of a parallel, really, what we are talking about here is very similar to the way the law and order works, right? So we have uh, a constitution, but you know the speed limit is not enforced by preventing cars from going faster than 65 miles per hour. It's violations of that speed limit is often detected by someone, like a cop, and then blame is assigned and people are appropriately incentivized not to break the law. So that's the kind of uh, analogy that we are working with. We are working with in this line of work also. So in terms of focusing on the audit part, the approach that we are going to take is we are going to start from the privacy policy, which will be long 
uh, English text. These could be a law like HIPAA, and we have done formalizations of HIPAA. We're going to convert that into a computer-readable privacy policy, one that a machine can process and be able to check if it has been violated. And in fact, we have done this. We have a complete formalization of both the HIPAA privacy uh, rule as well as the gromlich bliley Act that was reported in a paper a couple of years ago. And that, the one slide summary I have, I showed you already is as much detail I'll give you of this, of this work. What I'd like to focus on primarily is the audit work where we take this um, privacy policy as input and the organizational audit log, which you can think of as recording the actions that are going on in the organization involving personal information. And many organizations actually have such audit logs because they're required to keep them under the law. So many healthcare organizations, for example, who have electronic health records, those also record who has access to what information as well as disclosures from the hospital to other uh, third parties. And taking those two things as input, the audit box decomposes into two parts. There is the automated analytical engine, which will detect violations of the black and white policy concepts completely automatically. And then there are going to be these oracles who are going to try and give us insight into whether these gray concepts, these things like purpose restrictions, are actually uh, violated or not. And the first part of my talk, I'm going to focus on um, the first part of the technical presentation, I'm going to focus on this part. And then later on, I'm going to talk about how we could enforce purpose restrictions using a form of Oracle. And one way to think about this is really, when you talk about purpose restrictions, we are trying to get at a program that's designed to understand the human psyche. Did this person really do access, use this information for this purpose or not? What did they have in mind when they did this access? And we, want, we don't really yet have something like this very powerful oracle, but what we would like to do is approximate it in a way that has some provable guarantees. So uh, let me first talk about auditing black and white policy concepts. And this is joint work with my uh, postdocs, Deepak Garg and Limanjia. Deepak has now moved on to a tenure track position in Max Planck Institute. And this was published last year at the ACM CCS conference. So one of the key challenges in auditing that we try to address here is that audit logs tend to be incomplete. They're not going to record a complete behavior of everything that has happened. And there are many different sources of incompleteness. For example, uh, we obviously expect audit logs to be incomplete with respect to the future. And this is relevant for many, many privacy laws which talk about uh, obligations. So for example, these data, timely data breach notification laws refer to some future event happening. When a violation, when a breach has been detected within a certain amount of time, a notification needs to go to the customers who are affected. So the, since the audit log will only store past and current events, we don't expect that this information will be available at the audit log at the time the breach occurs. Another uh, sort of incompleteness arises from uh, you know, this kind of gray, gray information. There may not be information recorded in the audit logs of which can be about and that can provide evidence for whether certain purposes and beliefs were actually true. For, the, so for example, the concrete example for HIPAA that we had a few slides back. Sometimes audit logs tend to be distributed. And at one location, there may not be enough uh, information to decide whether a policy is true or not. And in conversations with uh, healthcare organizations, as well as with Nokia, who did a study uh, of collection of audit logs from people who were accessing their cell phones. They, the Nokia people were particularly interested in this setting because they had these audit logs which were spatially distributed and they wanted a form of auditing that could deal with spatial incompleteness. And this is particularly relevant for the healthcare setting because purposes play a huge role in HIPAA. And whether internally inside a hospital and information is being used for treatment or is being accessed for other reasons, such as curiosity and so forth, is a big concern for them. So much of the existing audit 
so I should say that the industry has started producing audit tools, and in fact, many healthcare organizations are beginning to use them. So there is a company called Fair Warning, for example, that produces an audit tool for healthcare organizations. But they tend to do something very simplistic. All they're doing right now is supporting SQL queries. So you could use that tool to query, find all people who have accessed more than, say, 200, made two, more than 200 accesses in a certain amount of time, things of that nature, which are useful in flagging potentially some suspicious activity. But there is no semantic basis really for deciding how good the coverage is and what they're missing and so forth. And uh, Cerner, which is one of the biggest EHR vendor, electronic health record vendors in the US, is also uh, now has this P2P Sentinel tool, which do, does something very similar. <clears throat> so, so how do we deal with incompleteness? So the way we are going to model uh, incomplete logs is by uh, using these three valued structures. So we are going to deal with all forms of incompleteness using uniformly using three valued structures. And the idea here is that given some predicates, some, some piece uh, of the policy about which we are trying to decide whether it's true or false, the log might either tell us that it's true or that it's false, or is this possible that the log has no information about it? in which case its, its truth value is going to be unknown, right? And then the, we can define the semantics or meanings of the formulas, these policies written out in a suitable logic, over these three valued structures. And what we have is an iterative algorithm that we call reduce that takes as input an audit log and a policy. And instead of coming back with a true or false answer indicating whether the policy was satisfied or not, it comes back with a simpler residual formula phi prime. So the idea is that it's, the reduce is going to check as much of the policy as it possibly could based on the evidence that's in the audit log. And the rest of the policy it's going to output as the residual policy, which will be checked only when the log is extended with additional information. So if you want to contrast this with how access control works in practice, think about file access control. When you try to access a file, the file system will either let you access or not. So it comes back with a true or false answer because there's enough information to decide whether you have the appropriate credentials to access the file or not. And similarly with information flow policies and, and so forth, typically you assume that there is enough information in the program to decide whether the policy is satisfied or not. Because the log is incomplete, the way we deal with that is by letting the algorithm come back with a partial answer saying that, well, the log satisfies this policy if and only if the simpler policy is going to be true. Right? So pictorially, you can think of this iterative process as you start off with the log and the original policy. This would be some encoding of something like HEPA, and we have actually done this for the whole of HEPA and gram leach bliley And then you run the algorithm reduce, and reduce checks as much of the policy as it possibly can using this log and comes back with the simpler residual policy. Then you run the algorithm again when the log is extended with additional information. And then it comes back with, again, a simpler residual policy over time. And you continue this process. And at any intermediate po point in this process, there can be input from these oracles about the gray concepts, right? So in the audit logs, we expect explicit information only about the black and white concepts. And these gray concepts come, input about that come from these oracles, which could either be humans or in the second part, in the later part of my talk, I'll give you a sense of an algorithmic way of actually implementing this oracle, which has some interesting properties. So that's the process. So now let's look at this in a little bit detail. What is inside? How does this reduce work? Uh, what does this formula, what do these formulas look like? So here's the syntax of the policy logic. This is expressive enough to express the whole of the HIPAA privacy rule and the gram leach bliley Act. And I don't want you to try and parse everything on this slide. The important thing to take away is that it is a fragment of first order logic. And we need the quantifications over unbounded, over infinite domains. Because if you think about HIPAA, HIPAA, if you look at the formalization, 
it requires quantification over things like sets of messages. And the set of messages is infinite because in English you can keep on constructing larger and larger messages, right? So we need quantification over infinite sets. But if you just use arbitrary quantification over these infinite sets, then it's very difficult. To, it's not possible to get a terminating algorithm for reduce. So we'll do some clever things to get a termination. But that's one other technical challenge to address. So really, there are two main challenges that arise here, one stemming from incompleteness of logs, the other arising from the first order quantification over infinite domains. These are the two sets of technical challenges. And since we have quantification over these infinite domains, this logic is expressive enough to express the kind of timed temporal properties that show up in many of these policies, as well as the kind of gray predicates, which will be uh, not handled by the algorithm. Right? So let me show you uh, how how this might apply to this, uh, this running example. So when we look at this, this was the example I had at the beginning of the talk. If we write it out in a logic, in this logic, then it looks a little bit like this. Again, I don't want you to try and read the formula. The one thing to notice here is that there are these universal quantifications over sets of principles, over principles and messages and time. And the black parts here are the black and white concepts. There will be information put in the audit log that'll help us resolve these things directly. And then these purposes and beliefs written out in red are the gray concepts that this particular algorithm will not handle. So when we apply this algorithm, the red parts will always show up in the residual policy. And later on, I'll talk about how we may want to enforce that part of the policy. Right? So in a little bit more detail, the reduce algorithm works as follows. So if reduce, so L is a log and P is a predicate, that's one part of the formula. The log will tell us whether the predicate is true, false, or unknown. If it's unknown, if it's true, then of course this reduce says that this is true. If it's false, then reduce says it's false. But if it's unknown, then reduce does not know how to evaluate the formula. So it'll just predicate, so it'll just return the whole predicate. So P it returns, so the residual formula, when you apply reduce to P and the va truth value of P is unknown, is just P itself. So in this case, it's saying, I don't know what P is. Maybe later on when the log is extended with additional information, I can figure out what it is. So that's the base case of the algorithm. And then, they, and then it proceeds recursively, right? So if it's a conjunction, then you just apply it to the parts and so forth. The interesting case is really this universal quantification. This universal quantification could be over unbound infinite domains, as I said before, right? So one naive way to deal with a universal quantification is that you can treat it as a conjunction. Look for every possible substitution of x, and then you say phi for that x1 and phi for x2 and so forth. But if you try to do that naively for universal quantification over infinite domains, then this is going to become an infinite conjunction. And then the reduce algorithm will never terminate. We don't have enough information. We cannot keep on running it for an infinite number of cases. So the observation here is that instead of doing that, let's restrict the class of formulas to those where uh, there is a guard, a formula C, such that there are only a finite number of instances of X that will make C2, C true. And those are only going to be the relevant instances of X. So at a very high level, if you want to think about this informally, you could quantify over the set of all possible messages. But the only messages that HIPAA governs are the messages that were sent out by the hospital. And there's only going to be a finite number of them. So the send, there could be a send predicate here capturing the fact that these are the messages that got sent out of the hospital. And you can look up the audit log to mine those finite substitutions. And there's only going to be a finite number of them. So once we know that this is a finite, there's only a finite number of X's that will satisfy C, then this becomes, this reduces to a finite conjunction. And then you can just replace this by a finite conjunction, and that works just fine. So now this is saying that, expressing that idea written out in a bit of a Greek font. But this is essentially saying that this formula returns the finite number of substitutions that will make C true, and then you run reduce for each of those conjuncts, <coughs> taking those substitutions. And then Psi prime is taking into account the possibility that there could be more substitutions in the future that arise because the audit log is incomplete. 
So that's the very high level idea of the reduce algorithm. So in this setting, it's dealing, the two things again coming back to the big picture here is we have to deal with incompleteness and we have to deal with quantification over, over infinite domains. Incompleteness is taken care of by this psi prime, which is saying that in the future, maybe we might get other substitutions. And the finite substitutions that are already, these finite substitutions are coming from the audit log. All right, so some amount of math, but let me show you how this looks like uh, in the example. Okay, so, so the general theorem here is that if the initial policy passes a syntactic mode check, then finite substitutions can be computed. So this C will have to be well moded. The details, uh, I'm going to point to the paper to those who are interested. And since if this happens, then we know the algorithm terminates. And it turns out that the entire HIPAA and the gram leach bliley privacy rules actually pass the syntactic mode check, which means the theorem applies and the algorithm applies to these uh, pretty substantial privacy laws in there. The tech report that reports on these laws are 128 pages or something long because it's, it's a lot of dense text when you compress it into formulas, it's really long. Now, if you want to look, come back to this example, what, what, what is the implication of this? Uh, how, how does this algorithm run on this example? Imagine that this is our incomplete audit log and this is our formula. And when we run reduce on this, what reduce is going to do is that for every quantifier that it, that it sees here, so there are these universal quantifiers and these existential quantifiers, it'll try to find the finite substitutions from the log. So I won't walk through this entire process, but let's look at one example, the send message. There's only one send in this log, there is this one. So then P1 gets instantiated to UPMC, that's the sender of the message. The recipient in this case was the Allegheny police, and the particular message under consideration is this M2. And similarly, the other substitutions come out of the log. So the idea here is, again, although the policy can refer to an infinite number, of infinite number of instances for these variables. There are going to be only a finite number of them in this log, and the algorithm can mine it from the log and figure out what's relevant. And so one, after one iteration of reduce over, over this log and this policy, you end up with this residual formula, which only has the gray concepts about which there is no information in this log. And while this is a very simplistic example and a very simple log, that it's possible to do it all in our heads, you know, we have actually applied this to uh, a simulated log and a policy that, uh, from the HIPAA privacy rule, which captures the entire, all 84 disclosure related clause of the HIPAA privacy rule. And the average time for checking compliance of each disclosure over a 15 megabyte log was about 0.12 seconds. So it actually scales reasonably well to, to logs of this size. And the other question here is, so that's performance. The other question here is how effective is it? Sorry, just get caught here. Yeah. 15 megabyte log is kind of what time period? Like it's something that we simulated, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's not a, so we are in the process of getting real audit logs from, through, we, so we, I'm part also of the SHARPS project, which is funded by the HHS and we have institutional partners at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and uh, Johns Hopkins, and we are going to get logs from them. So these are not, this is simulated logs. So once we get those logs and do the experiments, I can report on real numbers. Uh, well, now these are real numbers, but those would be numbers over real logs, yeah. The, the other question here is about mechanical enforcement, right? So note that there are, like I showed on the previous slide, you know, these kinds of gray concepts, what I'm calling gray concepts, this log, this algorithm just doesn't deal with it. Always will show up in the residual policies. So one question was in HIPAA, what percentage of predicates are actually black and white in the sense that I define, for which uh, there is a possible true false value. And that's about 80%. So about 80% of all atomic predicates in HIPAA are these black and white concepts. Yes. 
Right. Uh, so of the 84, 85 rules in HIPAA, there are 17 that are completely black and white. Yeah? So that's about one-fifth. So this is the overall 80% is overall 80% of the predicates are black and white, but the number of rules that are gray free is about 17. So that's about 20%. So that's not so bad. And then for of the other, I'm trying to remember, of the other um, 80%, I think about half have more than uh, 50%, about half have more than 80% predicates that are black and white. And, and then there are the rest, which are gray. So, I, I mean, this is, there, there are some things, it's a very good question also because you see the way reduce works, it always outputs this residual policy, right? And every time you see a quantifier, you will have, because you have to deal with incompleteness, there is a part that will kind of replicate the entire policy. So as the algorithm proceeds round after round, the formulas will actually grow, right? And after a few iterations, the formulas will grow big enough that the algorithm will not scale very well. So you need a mechanism for dealing with the gray predicates, either through human input or through an algorithmic manner. Otherwise, this algorithm will not work. Right, so the temporal modalities are, since I have universal quantification over unbounded domains, what I have done, what we have done, is encoded temporal constraints. All the time temporal properties are encodable in the logic that I described. And the complexity, I didn't get into complexity results and such. The complexity is also the same as for temp usual temporal, uh, propositional temporal logic model, tra model tracking, which is about P space complete. So those results generalize uh, in a nice manner to this richer, to this richer logic. Yeah, so that's a good question. So we started out with a simpler temporal logic, uh, which was propositional, but we couldn't express because we need quantify. We needed quantifiers. As soon as we got into quantifiers, we ran into this problem of how do you get the, much of the work on runtime monitoring has been on propositional logic model tricking. So the technical work here was really on getting it to generalize to the setting of with first order quantifiers. And this mode checking idea is the insight that lets us do it. Um, the one thing that maybe you're getting at is, okay. Okay. The incompleteness is part of the reason that this gets. Incompleteness is something that, as we have talked with c c practitioners, they really want a way of dealing with incompleteness in a robust manner. I mean, a special case of this is when the log is past complete. And then things become easier. So we also, in our technical paper, we have a result showing that if the log is past complete, so it's not, the only incompleteness is that the future has not happened yet then the algorithm reduces to the standard, uh, you know, well, sh I shouldn't call it standard because the first order uh, model checking runtime, uh, this kind of runtime verification for first order logic is not very standard yet. The closest to our work, which I'll get to in a few slides, is the work of David Bazin. He had a uh, invited paper at CAV a couple of years ago, and they have a metric first order temporal logic that is a little less expressive than ours, although they have done a lot more experimental evaluation with uh, recent logs. In fact, the Nokia data set, which we are trying to get now, is something that David Basin has experimented with, showing that it works, their algorithm works quite well. Um, the challenge in their algorithm, so 
why don't I come back to it in like two slides? So in terms of related work here, there have been a lot, fair amount of work, some of which uh, I did earlier on with people at Stanford, it, in specifying these kinds of privacy policies. And some of these are primarily about specification, not so much about enforcement. And others, like EPAL, lack the generality of, that we need for this kind of application. Uh, in terms of actual specification of real privacy laws, some work that we did earlier, about five years ago, looked at only a few clauses from HIPAA and gram leach Flyley, And these more recent work from UIUC and Stanford have looked at more substantial fragments, but uh, ours is the first to look at the entire, the entire HIPAA law. In terms of techniques, the nearest thing is this work from David Basin. And they are in the special case that you're talking about. They are assuming that they are, the logs are past complete. And they have efficient implementations, and they're making more use of, um, you know, I, the iterative process is more efficient than ours. But their mode checking is less expressive in the sense that they cannot express HIPAA and gram leach Flyley because of the specific way in which they've done the mode checking. So that's sort of the state of the art of where we are. All right, but as we have established, this doesn't solve the problem because 80% of the policies of the clauses in HIPAA still have these gray concepts, a lot of which involve purpose. And um, trying to do all of that manually is going to be just not scalable. So the next thing I want to talk about is how to deal with purpose restrictions and uh, how we may want to approximate an oracle like, like this one. And this is joint work with my student, Michael Shans, co advised with uh, Jeanette Wang. And this paper will appear um, next, next month at the IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy. So as I said before, purpose restrictions are going to be of this form. There are going to be at least two classes of purpose restrictions. One are what we are going to call not for restrictions. So Yahoo's practice is not to use the content of messages for marketing. And then there are going to be these only four restrictions. Uh, you give the Social Security Administration consent to use the information only for the purpose for which it was collected. And then in HIPAA, the corresponding thing is healthcare organizations will use information only for treatment and billing and payment operations and not for other things. Right? So, how, so what do these purpose restrictions mean and how would we try to enforce them? So the goal really is to give a semantics to these two classes of purpose restrictions, but we want to do that in a way that is parametric in the specific purpose information and action that should work for all purposes and all information and all types of actions, right? And in addition, we want to provide an auditing algorithm for, for, for that semantics. So that's the goal. So let's begin with a simple example. Imagine that we are in a hospital and someone has taken an x-ray and added the x-ray to the medical record and then this medical record gets sent over to a diagnosis, uh, sent over to a specialist for use in diagnosis. And the hospital's policy says that medical records should be used only for diagnosis. Right? So how do we determine whether in a setting like this, say this action was for diagnosis or not? How, how, what does it mean? How do we define what it means? How do we even define what it means for an action to be for a purpose? So let's take one attempt. The first attempt is that an action is for a purpose if it is labeled as such. So we are going to label actions with purposes. And if it has the label, this action is for diagnosis, then it is for diagnosis, right? So this seems a little simplistic. It, uh, it pretty much begs the question because how do we know that the labeling is actually right? On what basis do we do the labeling? Another problem is that one action can have different purposes depending upon the context of that action, right? So if you look at this example, there are, it's, let's add a little bit to this example so that there is the possibility to also send the record right after the x-ray is taken before it's added to the medical record. Now these two actions are the same. They are the send record action. Now, while we expect this could to potentially be for diagnosis, this one could not be for diagnosis because the x-ray was not even added to the medical record, right? And yet these two actions are the same. So we can't just label actions. It also depends on the context as captured by the states of this picture, right? So uh, 
we expect these to be for diagnosis, but that's not for diagnosis. So we want to refine this a little bit. So we notice that states matter. The purpose of an action may depend upon the state from which the agent takes that action. So our formalization of these purpose restrictions must include states. So let's take, um, let's, let's expand the definition a little bit. So now let's look at this example. If you look at this path, these actions are necessary and sufficient for achieving the purpose. If you go along this path, let's say at this point diagnosis is achieved, whereas this one is not sufficient because no diagnosis is achieved, the x-ray is not even added to the record. So an, a, another attempt could be that an action is for a purpose if it is necessary and sufficient as part of a chain of actions for achieving that purpose. So let's take that as our next attempt, right? But now look at this example. We have modified this example a little bit where after the x-ray is added, we can either send the record to specialist one or we can send it to specialist two. Now neither of these actions are necessary because instead of doing this, you can do this. Instead of doing this, you can do that and it still achieves the diagnosis. So although both these sends for diagnosis, both of these sends intuitively though, it appears that these should be for di diagnosis, yet the necessity definition precludes them for being from diagnosis. So necessity appears to be too strong. So that, <coughs> uh, on the other hand, notice that if neither of these sends happen, then no diagnosis is achieved, right? So we need a concept that's slightly weaker than necessity. So that gives us, takes us, gets us to non-redundancy. So the idea of non-redundancy is that given a sequence of actions, once you fix the sequence that reaches a goal state, an action in that sequence is non-redundant if removing that action from the sequence results in the goal no longer being reached. And in fact, this is an adapted counterfactual notion definition of causality. It's, it's very similar to uh, a definition of causality based on counterfactual. So that's going to be our third attempt. Our attempt three now is an action is for a purpose if it is part of a sufficient and non-redundant chain of actions for achieving that purpose. So that deals perfectly well with this setting because if you look at this sequence and you remove this action, then the purpose is no longer achieved, but if it is there, it is achieved, which means that it is non-redundant. And the same here, All right? So we have dealt with this example. But um, there are a few other considerations. One is when you are doing, say, diagnosis, you want a more quantitative notion of purposes because instead this specialist might be better than that specialist. So you'd ideally want whatever process is, if a better diagnosis is available, I wouldn't want the record to be sent to this specialist, right? So that's one consideration. Another consideration is that we might have probabilities in the process, which means that you might not get a diagnosis even when an action is for a purpose. So suppose you send this record as before to the specialist, but there is a probability of one by four that, that the specialist fails and you don't get a diagnosis. Does that mean that the action was not for the purpose? Intuitively, it shouldn't be the case, right? And yet, if you look at the non-redundancy definition, it rules it out. So that leads us to planning. Uh, this is the aha moment. We have, we, in order to allow for probabilistic failures, we cannot require that a sequence of actions actually furthers a purpose. We can only require that the agent plans to perform actions to further the purpose. And in addition to deal with quantitative purposes, we want to require that the agent adopts the plan that optimizes the expected satisfaction of the purpose. So that leads us to the thesis that plans matter, that an action is for a purpose if the agent planned to perform the action while considering that purpose. And now that we have reduced the definition of what it means for an action to be for a purpose to a definition in terms of planning, we can leverage work on models of planning to check for enforce purpose restrictions. So what is still open, this is the intuition, but the, the few other things that remain, we, how do we know that this hypothesis actually is true? We don't, but we will never be able to prove that, but we can at least provide some evidence in support of it. What does that formally mean and how do we audit for that, right? So these are the three pieces. So to answer the first question, we gave a survey, or not answer, but provide some evidence in support of that thesis. We, we gave us a, a questionnaire to 200 people recruited through Mechanical Turk. Uh, 
and we compared the predictions of two hypotheses to provided responses. So our hypothesis is this planning hypothesis that says that an action is for a purpose, if and only if that action is part of a plan for furthering the purpose. And this furthering purpose hypothesis, which was the reigning champion before this work, says that an action is for a purpose if and only if that action actually furthers the purpose. Right? So it requires the purpose to actually be furthered or achieved by that action. And when we did the survey, this turned out to be a clear winner. I mean, the, most of the people, so we did the survey in a way that there were four scenarios. In one scenario, both the planning hypothesis and the furthering hypothesis was uh, respected. And in that case, people said yes. But there were other scenarios in which this was uh, respected, but this was not, and people still said yes. And if this was not respected, and this was respected, then people said no. Right? So essentially, the separation showed out from the way the scenarios were constructed. I have some additional slides as backup if people have questions about the exact nature of the survey. And we can discuss that uh, later. All right, so, so I want to give some sense of how the auditing algorithm works without getting into a whole lot of technical details. But the audit algorithm, one way to think about this is that it takes as input the privacy policy. In this case, it's just these not for purpose restrictions and uh, only for purpose restrictions. The environment model for planning, which you can think of as these state diagrams that I was showing a little while ago, it's a little bit more than traditional probabilistic state transition systems in the sense that there's also these reward functions. It says how well the diagnosis or how well the purpose was achieved. And those are formally Markov decision processes. And then there's the agent behavior. The agent behavior you can think of as what the agent actually did, and that would be recorded, for example, in an audit log. So if you instantiate these things, then the environment model formally is a Markov decision process, and the agent behavior is the actual execution that is recorded in an audit log. And then this audit uh, algorithm should come back with whether the policy is obeyed or violated, and sometimes it may not be able to tell, so it could be inconclusive also. So how, what's the idea behind the audit method for only for? So the point here is to try, the, the idea here is to find all the strategies that are consistent with the observed agent behaviors, that is the audit log, under a model for purpose P. And if none of these strategies optimize the purpose P under the model, then, then we can say that the agent violated the only for P policy. Let me, it may be a little bit of a mouthful. So let me first show you in an example what this means. Let's look at this very simplistic example. You add the extra and then you send the record either to the good specialist one who achieves the high diagnosis score or to the not so effective specialist who achieves a low diagnosis score, right? So this is the environment model. This is the Markov decision process. Got rid of probabilities and such just to make the exposition simpler. Now, what could the agent do? One possible execution is this path, right? So if you look at this path where the record x-ray was added and it was sent to the first specialist, then this will be regarded as respecting the only for policy because the optimal plan given this MDP is exactly this path, right? Because this guy does a better job of diagnosis than this guy. This path achieves the purpose better always than this other path. So if the agent actually did these two actions, then they will be flagged as not a violation. But if the agent goes through this path and sends it to the less effective specialist, then since he did not do a very good job of optimizing, he will be, this will be regarded as a violation. Maybe he has a side agreement with this less effective specialist. Maybe this specialist gives him a kickback and so forth and uh, that'll be flagged as a violation, right? So while these examples, again, are very trivial, so they can fit on a slide, the algorithm is much more general and it works with arbitrary Markov decision processes. So in more detail, this algorithm compares the optimal solution of an MDP to the optimal solution when restricted to match the actions seen in the log. And if the restricted solution has a lower value than the unrestricted solution, then we know that the log shows 
suboptimal actions. And that's what's going to happen when you take the lower path in the example. So in this log, the restricted MDP is just these three states, and the optimal solution gives a score of two, whereas in the entire graph, the optimal solution is this path and gives a solution of six. So, since, so, so if you go on this path, it's suboptimal, and that'll be flagged as a violation. If you go on this path, on the other hand, you get the optimal solution, and that'll not be flagged as a violation. And in fact, we have a soundness theorem that shows, that demonstrates that the algorithm will return true if and only if the actions recorded in the log are not for the purpose. So this will be a way of finding violations. Of course, it assumes that the MDP model is correct, which is, which is, a, which is, a, which is not so, it's a reasonable assumption, but it's not so easy to get these MDP models. So to make this work more practical, we have to we have a way of constructing these MDP algorithms also. So in comparison to past work, while useful, many of these past approaches were not semantically justified in the sense that they involved labeling actions, but they did not say how to do the labeling, what's a good labeling and what's not. How do you decide that the labels are correct? Uh, going beyond labeling actions, people have looked at labeling sequences of actions, but the same complaint uh, applies to the same problem, applies to argument applies to that work also, or labeling agent roles or labeling code. So this work actually provides a semantic foundation for these approaches in the sense that it provides a basis for deciding whether a labeling is correct or not. How do you do the labeling in the first place? It also shows the limitations of each of these approaches. So in ongoing and future work, one of the things we are, uh, this is already there in Michael's thesis, is enforcing purpose restrictions on information use. So what I have talked about here is uh, what does it mean for an action to be for a purpose? But really in HIPAA and these other, other uh, privacy policies, the policies that are of interest are what does it mean for an information to be used only for a purpose or not for a purpose? And that's a little bit more complicated because there could be implicit flows of information. So the idea behind enforcing inf purpose restrictions on information use is to take this plan recognition idea, but to also inf influence, inform it by ideas from uh, information flow control and non-interference and settings like that. So the idea there is here I was saying that an action is for a purpose, if and only if it was part of an optimal plan for achieving the purpose. And I'm going to say that information is not going to be used for a purpose if the plan does not depend on the specific value of the information. So if you say, say, for example, if there's a policy that says gender will not be used for targeted advertising, then if I change the gender from male to female, then the plans should not be affected. The planning process should not use as input the, the gender, and therefore the plans should not change based on the gender. And the generalization there requires us to go from Markov decision processes to partially observable Markov decision processes. And the plan recognition algorithms uh, for auditing also generalize uh, to that setting. Now, there are a few other issues with this approach to try and make this practical. One is that we have throughout been achieving that these environment models, these MDPs are available. But if you go talk to an organization, they don't have these things documented anywhere. They have some rough idea of who is supposed to be doing what. But the environment models are very far from being known. So one thought here is, can we try and learn these environment models from data? And once we get the audit log data from uh, Northwestern Memorial and Johns Hopkins, well, if, you know, one thing he, that is nice here is that since these are, it's an MDP learning problem, we could use some, try to use some well-known techniques like Q learning or reinforcement, forms of reinforcement learning to do that. The other here is that we are talking about humans and planning as done by humans. And MDPs are a bit of a stretch for the way humans plan. So maybe there is a better model of human planning that we could try to use, but there isn't very much there isn't a well-developed theory of how humans plan that is operational enough to use at this point. But the thesis is, in its general terms, is just talking about planning and plan recognition. So it could be instantiated with a different model of planning if one becomes available and if that works better for that particular application. And as I mentioned a few times, we are planning to do now a case study with real, real audit logs once, once they become available. So 
The final picture that I, the final two pictures that I do want to leave you with is one is this slide of how we go from policies to operational policies that, and then the audit process which takes as input the log and the policy and in this case uh, completely automatically decides whether the black and white policies, uh, black and white concepts are enforced. And the main challenges in this piece was to deal with incompleteness and the expressivity of quantification over unbounded domains. And, and the main challenge in this part in dealing with purpose restrictions was when we started out, we didn't even know what it means. W what does it mean for an action to be for a purpose, only for a purpose or not for a purpose? Or information to be used only for a purpose or not for a purpose? And the semantic, uh, semantics and enforcement that has come out of it. It was somewhat surprising to us. We were stuck a long time at, for a long time we thought that it was going to be very similar to causality. But later on, this planning idea emerged as uh, a better, a better formalization of the semantics. And part, the, the bigger picture here is uh, audit and accountability mechanisms, I think, are going to get increasingly important for enforcement of these kinds of policies. Uh, much of my talk today has focused on audit. When we get to accountability also, there are interesting technical problems uh, for blame assignment and, and blame assignment and uh, deterrence that touches on uh, notions of blame assignment. The notion of causality shows up in blame assignment also. <coughs> and this punishment has taken us towards uh, uh, game theoretic mechanisms and learning techniques and such. Okay, so on that note, let me conclude and I'm happy to take any further questions. Thanks. So uh, many of the electronic healthcare logs have information about who accessed a medical record at what time and how that record was updated and things of that nature. A bit of provenance of information about who updated what. Um, so you can think of it as a temporal log. The, um, the Nokia logs, they haven't told us very much exactly what information they have in the logs. You know, there's still this NDA thing that's, CMU and Nokia hasn't agreed yet on a acceptable data use agreement. So I don't know exactly what's in there. <laughs> right. Um, so there, there, people have done, so Carl Gunter and his group has done a little bit of work on analyzing these Northwestern Memorial logs. And one thing that they have been able to do is uh, predict roles. So based on, so people talk about role-based access control, but role-based access control as a top-down mechanism doesn't work very well in practice because you start, people start off in some roles, but then they need other permissions. People keep adding roles. So over time, the organization doesn't have a very good sense of who is in what role. And if you think of purposes being tied to roles, then you have lost the count of who is in, assigned to what purpose. So what they have tried to do is based on access patterns as recorded in these audit logs, they have tried to predict roles of people. And they got about 50% accuracy. So that's not so bad from a research standpoint. Uh, practitioners would like fewer false positives. Uh, but that's one kind of thing that they've actually done with these real audit logs. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I th that's absolutely that's absolutely right. So the current practice in the healthcare industry that um, that uh, I've heard from people who are practitioners is that they have these audit uh, tools, which are very simplistic. So one of the things that they do, for example, is flag if there's a celebrity in a hospital, which in Pittsburgh usually means a football star, <laughs> then th those records are specially flagged. And every access that is made to those records generates an email that gets sent to the manager of the employee. And then there is an interaction between the manager and the employee. So that's offline, that's not something the tool is doing. But a person, a manager sits down with the employee and has a discussion of why they access. It's the responsibility of the manager to decide whether it was a legitimate access or not. And that's the kind of process that I expect that whatever accountability mechanisms we might come up with that involve algorithms, ultimately there will have to be a person in the loop because you know there will be i talked about one half in the talk of enforcing only for policies where if it says it's a violation it's actually a violation but if it doesn't say it's a violation that doesn't mean that it wasn't a violation so it had, there's soundness but not completeness one direction is missing and for the not for policies it's the other way around so in any case since the results are not going to be perfect we have we are only approximating you can think of these tools as providing guidance to people on what to focus on during an audit. And then there will have to be an interaction with a human to figure out whether it was a real violation or not. And so the malice versus, um, versus honest mistake will come out at that level. And the other thing that these kinds of tools can help with is actually with training, which is sort of what you are also hinting at. The, it, many hospitals conduct HIPAA training sessions. And much of that involves a video, a tutorial of some sort. And you, know, you do it for two days, you discuss certain things with employees, and then people forget. Whereas, because we have HIPAA written out in this kind of logic, you can query the tool and ask, under this condition, can I ask, send this information to this person or not? And the tool will come back and say, yes, you're allowed because this clause in HIPAA allows this disclosure. Or no, there is nothing in HIPAA that allows this disclosure. So, so you can think of this, I've focused on audit primarily, but you could also run the audit algorithm over a hypothetical scenario to understand what is permitted by the law and what isn't. And that can help a lot with training. Yes. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so that's a very good question. So that's beginning to get at uh, some of the things that we have been looking at in this other work. So it's, it's, it's one thing to have, are we running out of time? Sure. Okay. Uh, it's one thing to have a law, but if there is no enforcement of it, there is no incentive to do anything. The, having an audit log is not enough, right, unless you actually look at it. So there are a few things that come out of some of our other work, which I haven't talked about. One is that Organizations will tend to do internal audits if there is a threat of external detection. So suppose they didn't do an audit and didn't catch something, and that got detected externally and got a lot of bad press, and that actually affects their bottom line. Then organizations are incentivized to do audits. Right? So now you'll see that there are HHS is beginning to ask for external audits. The Health and Human Services are beginning to require external audits of some healthcare organizations. Um, you know, the FTC settlement with Google required Google to subject itself to external audits. 
and you know they then they have to hire companies like KPMG or one of these big audit companies to to do audits. So that's so that kind of incentive that those mechanisms have are beginning to show up. There is not that much of it yet. It was surprising that to me that when I talked with these um, people at unnamed organizations, they wanted their audit mechanisms to have low false positives. That was the only thing they cared about. Uh, not the only thing, but a major thing that they cared about. And the reason for that is they have a limited amount of budget and time that they want to spend on auditing. And they don't want to spend a lot of time investigating violation, potential violations that are not violations, right? So, so the 50% false positive rate is unacceptable to them because that means half the time they're chasing uh, unproductive uh, activities. So someone put an arbitrary number. I think it was 30%. They said it, more than 30% false positive is not acceptable. So they love this fair warning tool. The reason they love the fair warning tool is because you can ask these scanned queries like flag all celebrity accesses. More celebrity accesses tend to be violations than regular people's accesses. Then they have a few such heuristics like, you know, if the last name of the employee matches the last name of the patient, flag that as a potential violation. Because, well, you know, family tends to be nosy. <laughs> And there were these examples of violations where a mother-in-law found out that her daughter-in-law was pregnant and wanted an abortion, and she hadn't told her, and you know, she went around uh, telling people it was a mess. Uh, so there are a lot of such, there, there are a lot of such messes. And this, this kind of SQL queries is particularly well-suited for going after those five things that you know about. But to me, that's really dangerous, right? That's a little bit like spending your life going out of buffer, going after buffer overflow and format string vulnerabilities because those are the two things we know about, right? So part of the goal of this work was to try and be more semantically motivated in the way we do audits so that we can try to deal with false negatives <laughs> better. And uh, hopefully once we have more experimental results, so there, there'll be some evidence that that, that may be true. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> meeting without a comment. He's around uh, this afternoon and yes. tomorrow morning? Early morning, uh, oh, tomorrow morning till noon or so. Uh, just give him five minutes. Thanks.